A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company, the uh, first Bearing Arms Cam and Company of uh, four years of resistance as the Biden administration takes shape. <clears throat> what are the uh, most important and emerging threats to our right to keep and bear arms? We're going to talk about that on the uh, program today, but we are also going to be focusing on the resistance to Biden's gun control agenda that we are already starting to see at the state level around the country. So a a very important day, a very important show. Glad that you're with us here. Uh, And let's talk just for a moment or two about uh, the the emerging threats. What are the most uh, uh, critical things to keep an eye on? Uh, I would say right now, executive actions. Uh, Biden has promised a lot of executive actions on day one. And at uh, Bearing Arms, uh, we've got a piece talking about what some of those executive actions uh, could look like. Biden, during his campaign uh, and on his campaign website, talked a lot about passing legislation. That's going to be difficult, if not impossible, for Biden to do, at least with the legislative filibuster in place. Uh, But there are some steps. In fact, there was one thing that Biden said specifically he would do as an executive action, and that is banning the importation of, quote unquote, non-sporting rifles, what we would call modern sporting rifles. The uh, ATF says, no, 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 no. These aren't, these aren't sporting uh, firearms under the Gun Control Act of 1968. Uh, and so these modern sporting rifles, AR-15s, other semi-automatic uh, long guns, um, can be banned, at least the importation from overseas of these firearms can be banned. And unfortunately, Biden has some precedent to work with. George H.W. Bush did this back in the late 1980s. Uh, And this is something, again, that Biden said on the campaign trail and on his campaign uh, website that he was going to do. So I do anticipate that we will see that ban on the importation of, again, what we would call modern sporting rifles, what Biden would call an assault weapon, what the uh, Gun Control Act of 1968 calls non-sporting firearms. But gun control advocates have a number of other executive actions that they are urging the administration to take including redefining firearms. Uh, They want the ATF to redefine the definition of a firearm to include unfinished frames and receivers. So even though they're not a finished frame or receiver, they're not a firearm because they're a hunk of metal, gun control advocates say, well, that's close enough. If it's 80% complete, that's close enough. That should be considered a firearm. It should have to have a serialized uh, 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 identifying marker on it if it's going to be sold or possessed by any American citizen. Uh, So they're encouraging Biden to do that. They are also uh, requesting that the agency tighten its definition of what constitutes a firearm dealer. There is no bright line, uh, according to the ATF, as to when you become a firearms dealer. Basically, if you're making a living or making um, some of your living, Through the buying and selling of firearms, you are considered by the ATF to be a federal firearms dealer, and you should have a federal firearms license. If you don't, then you can be subject to prosecution. Um, This can sometimes happen, the ATF says, if you sell as few as two guns. Uh, But sometimes you could sell a dozen or more guns in a year and not uh, fall under those uh, terms that the ATF has uh, laid out. So gun control advocates want a bright line established. Basically, if you sell more than five guns per year, they want you to be considered a federal firearms licensee, and you would have to go through the process of getting your FFL, paying several thousand dollars uh, to uh, to acquire it and maintain it. Um, that, I think, is going to be a stretch to do via executive action, but they're going to try. I have no doubt they're going to try. Uh, They are also asking the Justice Department to require gun dealers to notify the government before a gun is delivered to a buyer when a background check is yet to be completed. Right now, you wait three days. If there is no yes, if there is no no, uh, under federal law, firearms dealers can release those firearms. So now ATF uh, uh, doesn't have to be notified. Gun control advocates uh, want the uh, FFL or the seller 
to tell the government, hey, we're, we've gone ahead and we've released this firearm. Um, there are, uh, again, a couple of other uh, action items that uh, Biden could take in the early going of this administration. Uh, but as I mentioned, we are already starting to see resistance to this agenda, and not just at the local level. Uh, at the state level, we're seeing some really interesting moves here. A couple of days ago, Governor Greg Abbott in the state of Texas said that one of his top legislative priorities this year is making Texas a Second Amendment sanctuary state. Now, Abbott was not the first to call for this. As a matter of fact, as a former Oklahoman, I do have to point out that uh, Senator Nathan Dam. Uh, from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, actually proposed making the Sooner State a Second Amendment sanctuary back in November of last year. Uh, so this is not just Governor Greg Abbott uh, calling for this, but I said when Abbott declared that this was one of his top legislative priorities that I anticipated that we would start to see other states follow suit. Uh, and we have, actually, here are just a couple of other headlines. This from uh, Arizona. Arizona Republicans file Second Amendment sanctuary bill to ban state aid in federal anti-gun activity. Uh, here's one from Missouri. Missouri senators hear testimony about the Second Amendment Preservation Act. So we have a number of states that have at least introduced uh, measures that would turn the in, entire state into a Second Amendment sanctuary. What's, what's interesting is that there are a couple of different arguments that are being used. There are a couple of different versions. So, for instance, uh, Governor Abbott wants Texas to be a Second Amendment sanctuary state. In Missouri, uh, the legislation is called the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And in essence, these two arguments, the, the, the two main arguments, um, the Second Amendment sanctuary movement bases itself in terms of how it wants to resist unconstitutional gun control measures, bases itself on the idea of sanctuary cities for illegal immigrants, or, or even California's sanctuary state law dealing with illegal immigration. The other way of going about this is to make a Tenth Amendment argument, to say that, well, the federal government doesn't have the right uh, to try to infringe on the uh, uh, ability to keep and bear arms, and so we're going to resist uh, any and all uh, federal gun control measures. I'll be honest with you, um, from a legal perspective, I think the sanctuary route is on more solid legal footing uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you go back to the 1980s, and there was a Supreme Court case um, called Prince, P-R-I-N-Z. And the challenge at that point was whether or not, or the question that was raised at that point was whether or not states and localities are required to enforce federal law uh, or whether that's up to the federal government to do so. And the Supreme Court, in essence, said, no, states are not required to enforce federal law. You can't impede the enforcement of federal law, but you are not required as a county sheriff, for example, uh, to actively enforce these federal statutes, but you can't get in the way of federal law enforcement doing so. So we know that, again, states don't have to cooperate with federal laws. And by the way, that, that goes back in practice uh, long before the 1980s. Um, if you watched my speech for uh, Lobby Day in Richmond on Monday, I, I talked a little bit about this. Going back to at least the, the, the mid-1800s, um, you can find this philosophy at work. When the Fugitive Slave Act was passed at the federal level in the 1850s, there was widespread local resistance uh, to federal enforcement of those laws. There was also resistance at the state level. We saw this with prohibition. We've seen this, obviously, with uh, illegal immigration. We've seen this with the legalization of marijuana at the state level while it's still illegal at the federal level. This is, again, a, a, a strategy that fits comfortably uh, inside of the Constitution and comfortably inside of 
statutes that uh, uh, you know have already been litigated. Uh, we know that we can do this. We know that we have the right to do this. Second Amendment, excuse me, a Tenth Amendment challenge, on the other hand, is a little bit dicier a proposition, uh, legally speaking, based on existing court precedent. Uh, you know, the courts have found expansive powers for the federal government in the Commerce Clause, uh, and a, a lot of the uh, preservation uh, ordinances. So Kansas passed one, Montana passed one a few years ago. There are a couple of states that have basically said, look, what happens inside our borders uh, is up to us in terms of the right to keep and bear arms. The federal government has no place, it says right there in the Second Amendment, shall not be infringed. Uh, and so it's up to us, the states, to set our own gun laws. There is no room for the federal government. These laws have rarely been put into practice. In fact, I, I don't really think that they've, I actually even say rarely, I don't think these laws have been put into practice. You haven't seen the state of Kansas, for example, uh, say, you know what, we're not going to uh, follow NICS. We're not going to use NICS anymore. Or we're not going to pay any attention to the National Firearms Act. Uh, you want to own a full auto? Go for it. Uh, we're not going to say anything about it here in Kansas, and we're not going to, uh, allow the federal government to step in and uh, try to prevent you from owning one. We have seen uh, a couple of court challenges to the idea, generally speaking, that states can preempt um, the uh, enforcement at the uh, by federal authorities of uh, a federal law within certain states. That argument has not gone well for Tenth Amendment proponents, unfortunately. So if I were offering free advice, which I guess is what I do here on this program, if I were offering free advice to lawmakers on how to handle this issue, I would say, and it, it sounds weird, but I would say look to California for your guide. Because a few years ago, Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill into law that established California as a Second Amendment sanctuary. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, oh. Were that were the case. No, not a Second Amendment sanctuary state. A sanctuary state when it comes to illegal immigration. And basically laying out that uh, state and local law enforcement agencies were not going to cooperate with ICE. They were not going to lift a finger to help the, uh, the federal immigration agents do their job. You can like or dislike that bill that became a law. But what's important is that the Supreme Court let that law stand. They, they didn't hear a case challenging this law, so the, the law is on the books. Uh, and it seems to me like if we were to try to mirror the language of that California bill as much as possible, but apply it to the Second Amendment instead of applying it to illegal immigration, uh, that again, we would be on pretty firm legal ground. And I do anticipate that the resistance to Joe Biden's gun control agenda is going to take many forms, uh, both, again, at the local level, at the state level, and in Congress, and in the courts, uh, as each and every one of these uh, uh, new action items from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, I think are likely to face a court challenge. But in terms of being proactive, I, I think we're going to see an explosion of interest in Second Amendment sanctuary communities. Uh, the, the, the state level Second Amendment sanctuaries, I think, are, I don't want to say they're the most important, but I, I, I think that they offer the uh, best chance to see a, a united front of resistance. But the local measures are important, too. You know, in Virginia, in late 2019... Probably, uh, let's say the the you know six weeks or so after election day to the end of the year, uh, in the uh, uh, state of Virginia, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, excuse me, we saw dozens of counties and towns uh, approve these Second Amendment sanctuary ordinances. Some of them were more symbolic than others, but the the basic thrust of each and every one of them was: we're not going to spend our local money. We're not going to fund our sheriff's department to go out and enforce unconstitutional gun control laws. Uh, some of them noted as well that law enforcement has discretion as to what laws they're going to enforce. So if a county sheriff faced with a finite number of deputies 
and a finite amount of dollars decides, well, our priority is going to be enforcing laws against violent crime. Uh, our priority is going to be trying to stop the uh, influx of opioids that are leading to a staggering number of drug overdose deaths. And we're not really concerned about uh, enforcing federal gun control laws. If federal agents want to come in and do that, they're, they're more than welcome to, but it's not going to be our priority. That is a really, really important step. And it is not purely symbolic. It's symbolic now because we haven't seen that assault on the right to keep and bear arms yet. But it doesn't mean that these resolutions are going to be mere symbolism in the future. So we've got a long road ahead of us. Uh, we know that the threats to our right to keep and bear arms are real. We have seen anti-gun activists try to use the um, riot at the Capitol as an excuse to go after the open carrying of firearms. Uh, we know that they still, even though it uh, is, is unlikely that at this point, Joe Biden's gun ban and compensated confiscation scheme could get through, through uh, Congress, we know that they're still interested in that. Their agenda hasn't changed. They still want what they want, but what they can get, right now anyway, is going to be less than everything that they want. And this is how gun control advocates work. This is how politics works. You take one bite at a time, right? And then you go back for more. So we're going to have to do our best to close off the buffet, make sure they can't get a bite to eat, uh, and at the same time, use the power that we have in states that, that do have pro-Second Amendment majorities to strengthen and secure our right to keep and bear arms, to challenge these restrictions in court, to uh, pursue litigation against the Biden administration uh, if and when they overstep the, the constitutional bounds that they're limited to uh, and start infringing on our right to keep and bear arms. We are in for a slog. There are going to be setbacks, but there are going to be victories as well. So don't give up hope. And uh, hey, now we get to start using that hashtag resist. Like the uh, anti-gun activists did for the past four years. They're going to start using the hashtag obey, by the way. It's only about resisting when they're not in charge. Once they're in charge, yeah, resist turns into compliance. All right, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, uh, our good deed of the day. In our recidivist report, we'll start there with a story out of Washington State. Tri-City Herald reporting on a $200,000 nationwide warrant issued for a 16-year-old uh -huh, who apparently um, absconded from his, uh, quote, extensive supervision. Yeah. Tyshawn Brooks has 12 convictions from 2019 and 2020. He's 16 years old. He has 12 convictions over the past two years, including possessing a gun at school, resisting arrest, a protection order violation, assaults, um, was accused of shooting a former classmate in the leg while trying to buy an e-cigarette, and now Brooks has a $200,000 warrant out for first-degree assault and first-degree robbery from a January 8th deal. Prosecutors say that uh, went bad. Deputy Prosecutor Kristen McRoberts uh, said uh, that uh, Brooks' whereabouts are currently unknown to police. He is on, quote, selective aggressive probation for his prior cases. Apparently not aggressive enough. 18-year-old uh, Guyani Rosas Morales drove himself to a uh, clinic in Kennewick, Washington, for treatment uh, not long ago. Bleeding uncontrollably, responding officers heard him screaming in pain. Uh, he underwent surgery to repair his femur. Two gunshot wounds resulted in his thigh bone being broken in three places. He was uh, hospitalized for several days while he recovered. Uh, he said that he knows Brooks from middle school that arranged to sell him two boxes of puff bars. I don't know what that is. Uh, but when they met up, Brooks got in the back seat of his car. An unknown man sat in the front passenger seat. Then the man pulled out what the victim believed was a BB gun, ordered him to hand over the two boxes of puff bars. Uh, Roses Morales said he gave him one box, claimed that was all he had. The second box hidden there in the vehicle. That's when Brooks allegedly demanded the second box, along with uh, the uh, 
of the man's wallet, necklace, and ring. Rosas Morales said he refused because the jewelry had sentimental value. He believed that the older suspect's gun was not real. He said at that point he didn't know that Brooks was armed. Well, Brooks then got out of the back seat of the car, allegedly walked up to Rosas Morales' open window and shot him twice in the leg before he and the other suspect ran off. So again, now he's on the loose. They don't know where he is. Twelve convictions over the past two years. Kind of makes one wonder why Brooks wasn't behind bars to begin with. Sounds to me like, okay, yeah, you, you, you give somebody a chance, right? We're going to give you a second chance. Are right, we going to give you a third chance? Okay, Tyson, we're going to give you a fourth chance. I don't think a judge should say, look, we're going to give you a 12th chance here. Not in a two-year period. At that point, pretty clearly a threat to the community. And pretty clearly, uh, if his life is going to be changed around, it's not going to be through intensive or aggressive probation. Now, on to our armed citizen story, which I got to tell you is one of the craziest armed citizen stories that I've run across. It happened in Cypress, Texas a few days ago. It was about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, a homeowner uh, gets to his house, pulls in. Ricky Brandon's his name. Pulls into his driveway, gets out of his car. Three guys with guns run up to Ricky and start yelling and screaming at him. Ricky thinks this is a, a robbery. So he runs into his house, tries to shut the door and close it behind him, but they barge in after him. So Ricky then runs and grabs his gun, and a gunfight ensues. Now, Ricky's wife is upstairs. Their grandkids are upstairs. His wife comes down the, the back stairs, is confronted by one of these armed guys, uh, and it said, uh, what he told us to get on the floor, he was going to shoot us. I was trying to tell him, what are you doing? Who are you? I have kids in the house. I have babies in here. Well, she and the grandkids eventually made it out of the house, but inside, the shooting still continues. Nobody was hit, amazingly enough. Ricky Brandon says he stopped firing because one of these guys claimed that he was a law enforcement officer. He said, hey, stop. I'm, I'm a police officer. Ricky Brandon says, I threw my gun down. I said, look, I'm coming out, and I came out. They threw the cuffs on me, and they started wailing on me, he said. Brandon said he was hit in the back of the head with a gun and then beaten before he was dragged outside to where sheriff's deputies were. And here's the thing. These guys weren't technically home invaders, even though I believe they committed a home invasion. They were bounty hunters. And they were looking for somebody who apparently used to live at that house. Somebody who was not Ricky Brannon. They didn't ask for identification. They didn't ask to see who this guy was. And by the way, under Texas law, they had no right to enter that house. They also had no right to claim to be a law enforcement officer. So these three bounty hunters, we don't know their names, we don't know the bail agency that hired them. Uh, they are now facing charges, I think, and I think they're being undercharged, quite honestly. They're facing charges of burglary and felony after entry. I think attempted kidnapping might be uh, appropriate. I think attempted murder might be appropriate, although I guess you have to figure out who fired first. Uh, did these bounty hunters believe that they were acting in self-defense, even though they invaded somebody's home? Uh, anyway, the bounty hunters are facing criminal charges. Ricky Brandon is not facing criminal charges. I hope Ricky Brandon knows a good attorney, and I hope he sues the pants uh, off of everyone involved in this incident where he could have been killed, his wife and grandkids could have been killed for no reason whatsoever, for a case of mistaken identity. It's absolutely unbelievable. But I am glad that uh, Ricky had a gun to protect and defend himself from the folks who thought that he was someone else. Finally today, our good deed of the day. This is a uh, great story from uh, Florida. W-I-N-K uh, with the story of a woman who is actually looking for her good Samaritan. Um, this woman, Megan Hall, says she's grateful to be in live. And she is looking for the man who performed CPR on her more than a week ago at a Walmart. Uh, it was in Fort Myers, Florida. She said she was just there shopping when all of a sudden she said, uh, I went down. She said, it's miraculous. When you drop dead, you have that much time before, you know, you're not going to be saved. She had a massive heart attack. Uh, thankfully, there was somebody there. She said, I'm not sure where he came from. Behind me, a customer or an employee did heart compressions on me until the ambulance came and took me. And she said, he definitely saved my life. Now, Hall thinks she's going to get to go home today. And uh, she plans on learning CPR when she gets home. She wants to be able to pay it forward. But uh, she says, I would love to find him. I want to know who he is. If he doesn't want publicity, at least properly, let me thank you. 
So if you were in Fort Myers, Florida, about a week and a half ago, and you saved a woman's life, and she collapsed in a Walmart, Megan Hall would really like to say thanks in person. And whoever you are, in the right place, at the right time, and willing and able to do the right thing, we thank you for your very good deed. Now, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. But tomorrow on the program, we're going to talk with Cynthia Norman. Do you remember that name? She was the Lyft driver who defended her life from an attempted carjacking in Cleveland not long ago, used her legally owned gun to do it, and was then dismissed by Lyft afterwards because she violated their policy about drivers being armed while they're working for the uh, ride-sharing firm. Yeah. Lyft and Uber both say if you're driving for them while you're driving, you have to be disarmed. Uh, Cynthia Norman is going to share her story and talk about what she thinks about that policy uh, and what she thinks the policy really should be. So that's coming up on tomorrow's Pairing Arms Cam and Company. Thank you again for being a part of the program today. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you'll never miss a program. Also, we're on Rumble at Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. We certainly do appreciate your support. Don't forget to check out BarryandArms.com throughout the day for more Second Amendment news and information. And we'll be back tomorrow as well. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.